organizations' internal networks are overly permissive and can't distinguish trusted from untrusted applications. Attackers abuse this condition to move laterally through networks, bypassing address-based controls to spread malware. Edgewise abstracts security policies away from traditional network controls that rely on IP addresses, ports, and protocols, and instead ties controls directly to applications. Edgewise allows organizations to analyze the network attack surface and segment workloads based on the software and how it's communicating. Edgewise monitors applications and protects data paths using zero trust segmentation. Visit edgewise.net forward slash security weekly to get your free month of visibility. Some restrictions apply. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then Gravwell is the solution for you. Gravwell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. Gravwell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Endgame's converged endpoint security platform is transforming security programs. Their people, processes, and technology with the most powerful endpoint protection and simplest user experience, ensuring analysts of any skill level can stop targeted attacks attacks before information theft. Endgame unifies prevention, detection, and threat hunt to stop known and unknown attacker behaviors at scale with a single agent. For more information, visit endgame.com. Welcome back everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. Some of you have told us that you're overwhelmed by the amount of content that we distribute here at Security Weekly in an attempt to make it a little easier for you to find what you're inter interested in even. We've created our listener interest list. That's right. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, click the button to join the list, and eventually we will come up with a system that will notify you when we publish content that's in your area of interest. Uh, let's see. Our guest uh, for this segment is Federico Simonetti. He's the CTO of Exceed Corporation, as well as a former ethical hacker. I'd say once an ethical hacker, always an ethical hacker. He is a former professor of operating system security at the University of Milan and has also developed software for the Italian anti-terrorism and anti-pedophile police. Welcome Federico to the program this evening. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, Matt, you, I think, prepped this. Yes, you seem to have known Federico from like so way Full disclosure. Way, way back in the days of Monte Gaulle, no, is what no, we used no, to no, say. No, no, I, no, I, I, I'm an advisor to Exceed. Ah, uh, yes. Dave Corba and, uh, went over to help and uh, asked me to help um, advise uh, Exceed. And when Federico did his pitch to me, I was like, dude, you're on to something here, mm -hmm. right? And um, I thought it was a great opportunity to really showcase some of the work that Federico has done in the identity space of, we talk a lot about eliminating the password. Mm -hmm. This is how do you eliminate the username and the password? And I think it's a really um, innovative approach to thinking about how do we reinvent the identity market? And what I wanted Federico to do tonight is one, give us a little overview of, of what he's built, but then actually show us how this stuff works. How do you have the ability to potentially remove username and password as the authenticator and use that to secure systems in a way that I don't think many people have thought about. And so that's what um, the session's going to be about. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, I actually do have some uh, uh, slides, if I can uh, share, uh, that I, I would like to uh, use as a guideline as I talk uh, to make sure that I cover all the topics, uh, um, if that's okay. Please do. Okay, I should be able to. Okay, there you go. I recognize oh. the logo so we can see it. Perfect. Can you see it now? Yes. Cool. So it all starts uh, from the realization that there is a problem. And pretty much every startup here in the Silicon Valley or in this space, wherever the startup comes from, uh, begins with the realization that there is a problem. 
And uh, in this particular case, I think that this is one of the very few instances where the existence of the problem doesn't even have to actually be uh, proven because it's something that pretty much everyone knows. It's before everybody's eyes. Every week, every other week in the news, uh, there's a, a large, large hacks, uh, well, not ethical, uh, of identity databases. I mean, Marriott, for example, 500 million identities. And these are a few things that uh, we all pretty much know. Uh, usernames and passwords, okay, can be broken. This is probably not new for anyone. Uh, online biometric authentication also uh, can be weak because uh, when biometric authentication can actually be a relatively effective way to identify a user on a device that actually performs that type of identification on the device, the moment you acquire, for example, the fingerprint minutia and send it over to an authentication server somewhere else, uh, there have already been a number of instances where authentication systems of this type have been uh, successfully broken into. Uh, now, also, Federico, second factor uh, and multi-factor authentication. Federico, uh, I, sorry. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to interject there. I think the, the turning point for me with biometrics was, um, was it Heather Mahalik? Is she the one of the um, Sans mobile, the Sans yes. instructor mobile device? Yep. Uh, essentially, yes. she was describing it that your biometrics on your phone, in, in this case, were stored as basically a hash on mm -hmm. your phone. And that's essentially what biometrics boil down to is computers interpret them as a hash. And as as we know, it's all about where do you store that hash? Can you replay that hash? And all of those more traditional attacks apply. It's not necessarily like we display it in Hollywood, you know, where the eyeball is on the end of a pen or you're cutting someone's hand off, right? It's much easier and a lot less messy to get the hash yeah. once it's been uh, translated into uh, the computer. Oh, that most definitely. Uh, and uh, uh, also, second factor and multi factor authentication. I do actually recall a, a quite brilliant article by Kevin Mitnick uh, where he shows that it can be relatively easy to break those two. Uh, now, um, a topic that maybe um, fewer people are familiar with uh, is uh, SAML 2.0 or OpenID Connect identity providers those identity providers that normally you put in front of your identity database. Uh, but again, just uh, uh, browse the news uh, uh, every week, uh, and you will probably find at least one break-in into one of these uh, uh, services. And uh, one thing that I am uh, particularly opposed to is uh, identities hosted in and by SaaS solutions. Basically, all those people that, that uh, tell you, uh, you know what, just give me your identities because I am so much better than you at protecting them. And then what happens? This happens. Almost 5 billion identities have been stolen or compromised in the past two years. And uh, yes, many of these names, uh, and these, this is not a comprehensive uh, overview, but many of these were customers of uh, competing solutions. The tradi well, those that I call traditional solutions, the ones that tell you, give me your identities. I want to own your identity database. So yeah, and Federica, what, uh, it's interesting as I've done interviews and a lot in the identity and access and authentication. If you think about it, when a site stores your username and password, on their systems, what Federico is saying is they, they own your identity, right? Which means an attacker can break in, they can steal your identity. What a lot of the newer technologies and in, in, uh, companies are in this space promoting is basically you own your identity, that someone can't break into wherever you're authenticating to and steal your identity, that you actually own your identity. Someone has to hack you to get your identity, not the 
40, 50, 60, <clears throat> or 100 places that are storing a username and password that is essentially your identity. Did I capture that correctly, Federico? Yes, yes, absolutely. Plus, there are highly regulated scenarios like government entities, particularly those that pertain to the DOD, that use derived credentials and uh, the uh, parent certificates are stored in active directories that can't be moved by law. So uh, how mm -hmm. do you make that live together with solutions that actually tell you, hey, give me that identity database. No, I can't. And I can't do it by law. So, well, yeah, uh, and there's third... also the, the concept of uh, federated identity. And what uh, I actually shared a, a cubicle or uh, was a few cubicles down from um, Steve Carmody, right, who was working on Shibboleth. And essentially what they were promoting, and I get it, I'm not knocking the project, but in, in this context, right, like basically... Paul says he's Paul because he works for University A. When Paul goes to University B, University A and B can share my identity information. So when I go to University B, I authenticate and they know Paul is Paul. And how is that secured? Because now not just like University A has my identity information, but University B could access it. And that could be problematic. Federico, am I making somewhat sense? Okay. Absolutely. I mean, that's a scenario that I've seen throughout my entire life. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely a need to design something that was new and uh, unseen before from a logical standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of just trying to leave the situation and the status quo as is and try to invent new barriers and new ways to protect the way it's always been done, uh, in my opinion, there was a need to truly design something that would work differently from a logical standpoint. So I, I heard actually that this was another uh, aha moment for me. Uh, November last year, I think, uh, um, a beautiful keynote by uh, Nadella, the Microsoft CEO, and he stressed so much uh, in the need to go passwordless. Uh, I think he, he said the word passwordless. Uh, 12 times in less than four minutes. I'm like, yes, okay, I do agree with you. What about usernames? You know, the username is, is half of your identity mm -hmm. and is the half that probably changes much less frequently than your password. But your username very often corresponds to your email address. And that already in itself has value. You know, how many lists of how many millions of email addresses are for sale? on the dark web, and then we all have to fight another phenomenon, spam. So why would I give away my claimed identity? The problem begins way before I had to use my password. The problem begins the very instant you're trying to log into an application, mobile app, web app, whatever you're trying to log into, and the first information you're asked is your username. There you already have a problem. So let's say that we are we are in need to find a way to uh, get rid of all credentials, traditional credentials, reusable credentials. Uh, there's a need to go beyond uh, multi-factor, also because it's complicated. It makes uh, the user experience more cumbersome because I have to provide my username and then second step, my password. And then I have to wait for whatever, uh, maybe a text message, maybe uh, something, you know, a dedicated app that receives some, some other code. Uh, uh, people will not like it, already don't like it. And plus, it can be hacked. Um, but wait, Federico, I thought if I had a username and then I had a password that that was two-factor authentic. Is that not... That's not <laughs> no. actually no. That's the, the password is your first factor, and then the second factor is typically a one-time password or one-time code. Those uh, it's, you know those six digits that your bank sends you via text message on your phone, and you insert after you, uh, your password after validating your password. That is your second factor, but it it doesn't have to be that. It can be any additional form of authentication. And this is not nothing new. I mean, in 1984, multi-factor authentication was already present in the SSH protocol. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you, you can have username and password as well as PKI right. uh, authentication, and you have you can force your SSH server to require all of the supported authentication methods. And Federico, that was in the original SSH protocol standards? That was a proposal in the original SSH mm-hmm. protocol standard, and it was either or. In the SSH2 protocol, mm-hmm. you can have an end between the two. Therefore, you can force oh, the user to authenticate with hmm. the first factor and the second one and the third one and as many factors as your SSH2 server supports. Awesome. So it, it has it has been uh, included with the end logical operator inside the protocol. Um, not only we wanted to do something, uh, you know, one, one step further, go one step further and design something that can withstand uh, current uh, as well as future cryptanalytic attacks, uh, including the ones based on quantum computing. Now, obviously, uh, there are uh, studies about lattice encryption uh, uh, to defeat the Shor algorithm. Uh, so that's one way, like try to find encryption algorithms that can defeat uh, uh, quantum decryption, quantum cryptanalytic attacks. But that's not what we're doing. We started from a completely different uh, assumption. Let's assume that whatever we do to encrypt and conceal the traffic will be defeated. What can I do in that case? Can I use uh, non-reusable information so that by the time someone, a third actor, has sniffed it, decrypted it and acquired the information that I sent in clear, that information is dead. It cannot be reused in any way. So let's, let's put ourselves in that, uh, in that scenario. And because we don't like hard challenges, we like impossible challenges, we wanted to make all of this also easy to use. Easier, definitely easier in terms of UX than uh, 2FA and MFA and traditional solutions. So we came up with, buzz. let me skip this slide, it doesn't matter. But I would like to annotate for a moment on this one instead, because this is actually uh, pretty relevant. So what did we actually do? Uh, First of all, we took the problem and we split it in two halves. Uh, Whatever can be reached can and will be attacked. Therefore, what we've done is uh, we have designed a piece of software that we call Request Collector, and this piece of software resides somewhere on the internet, in the public cloud. It can be reached by anyone from anywhere. But this piece of software is designed to be able to receive authentication requests from anyone and anywhere and just keep them locally here on the request collector itself. A couple of notes on this particular piece of software. We haven't used, uh, uh, this is not P-code, so it's not uh, Java, it's not .NET. Uh, This is actually compiled uh, uh, in binary code to run on the CPU. So we know for sure that there are no leftover functions from the, from the framework that could be potentially hijacked to make this piece of software do something else. Mm-hmm. This is a four megabyte executable. When's the last time you've seen a four megabyte ex- executable? I mean, without DLLs and third party dependencies. It also doesn't rely on OpenSSL or OpenSSH or third party libraries. Uh, hard yeah, lead Federico, anyone. I, I always wondered why like I download the Facebook Messenger app and it's like 384 megabytes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's, just, that's a very good point. Way uh, too much uh, attack surface for my liking. I'm sorry? I said it's way too much attack surface for my yeah. liking. Uh, so yeah, a, 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 definitely yeah. for my liking as well. Right. So we, we really made sure that if you if you try to decompile this exe, uh, you will see that really there is not a single useless 
function in it. Every single function has a purpose, and this piece of software can only and exclusively receive re authentication requests from anywhere and store them locally. This is the piece of software that obviously needs to talk to everybody, so you can send your authentication requests to this piece of software in very many forms, like REST API, but it can be SAML 2.0, OpenID, mm -hmm. it can be OAuth 2. If there is a standard protocol, the request collector supports it. But the key is that the request collector cannot send those authentication requests to any other piece of software ever. There, there are no functions to do that inside the binary code of this piece of software. So all it can do is keep them here locally in its local list of received authentication requests and nothing else. So we basically just built the most useless piece of software <laughs> ever. <laughs> because we built something that receives your requests and has absolutely no way to fulfill them. Fulfill them. So <laughs> obviously, we had to build something else, right? So we built what we call the authentication agent. And this is where things start to become a little bit more interesting. So the authentication agent is designed to run inside uh, your uh, network or a subnet of your network, uh, any subnet that has uh, uh, visibility on uh, your actual identity database, which I just circled in red right here. Uh, but the key point is that you don't want a copy of this identity database anywhere outside. So you're not trying to move it or copy it or replicate it anywhere. And you don't want it to be reachable ever from outside. So this firewall is actually completely closed. There basically is not a single inbound port forwarding or NAT rule on this firewall that could ever allow anyone from outside of this subnet to send even a single IP packet to either the agent or your Active Directory. So Federico, just... I, I wanna stop here because one of the things that was really interesting when I was doing the original briefings with the team was when you open up authentication to Active Directory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you know how many inbound ports you actually have to open on your firewall to allow that's that to quite, happen? Yeah, it's quite a few. It's, it's, I do. It, it's, uh, it's, uh, depending on the operating system you run, your Active Directory or uh, open LDAP, uh, mm -hmm. uh, your LDAP uh, identity database on, uh, it can be as low as eight ports. But uh, according to Microsoft's knowledge base, uh, uh, if you really want to use all the attached services and the bells and whistles, and it's more than 20 ports, hmm. including inbound, including the inbound the through your ports. firewall. Yeah. I mean, that I was shocked when I, because I was just thinking it's a single port that you could put some controls around. No, it's, it's dozens of ports. Amazing. It's amazing. If you, and if you do want to have an effective mm -hmm. federation tactic between that Active Directory and another branch of, uh, of your Active Directory forest that, that is in a different separate network, then there is even more ports on both networks that have to be open and because these two Active Directories have to be able to synchronize among each other, talk to each other, replicate with each other. Uh, it's it's a real mess. It widens think, the attack surface I think by... <laughs> I, I cannot even begin to describe, uh, you know, I'm horrified. Thinking here's, about here's my theory. I think after a certain number of ports, let's just call it seven, most administrators just open up all 65,500 <laughs> and 36 if you include zero. Yeah, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I cannot, for, for, to, to avoid lawsuits, I cannot share uh, the contents of some emails that I have mm -hmm. received from people that in their email signature carry the title senior system administrator. Yep. Uh, who hired you in that position? Seriously. But anyway, uh, it, well, it, 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 it is, it's, it's, crazy. Com it's complexity too. And, and what I like about this model, uh, Federico as well, is that I think it was waterfall security is one of the vendors in industrial control systems. They have a similar system. Mm -hmm. They basically say anything in your ICS, uh, you know, operational networks, things can get out, nothing can get in, and it's actual physical hardware inside of their technology 
that does not allow packets mm -hmm. uh, to get in. I love yeah. solutions like that that like are very very limiting to say. Absolutely. Get, no, you know what else no, works this in. way? Control systems for nuclear power plants. Yeah. Yep. So it's exactly it's it's inspired to that concept, even mm -hmm. though the, clearly the inner workings are obviously completely different, uh, but the concept, the inspiration yeah. is is quite similar. I like it. So basically, now that we have this single object here outside that does nothing, and this agent inside here, a completely closed network, we can actually take advantage of one thing that pretty much all firewalls come pre-configured with. They do not allow inbound traffic, but they pretty much all of them are pre-configured to allow outbound traffic of a certain kind, typically towards port 443, HTTPS. Uh, you know, you, you will have to browse the internet, uh, and uh, most sites are now HTTPS, so you can perform actually outbound connections. And this is what, what it is. The agent uh, actually performs an outbound connection. So the first uh, SIM packet uh, originates from the agent uh, directed to the request collector, is signified by this very large orange arrow in this uh, chart. And that is a WebSocket connection. We use WebSocket because it's a clever way to, uh, to pretend that a traditionally state, stateless uh, protocol like HTTPS uh, is stateful, or it, it, it can be used as if you had an actual socket uh, running on it. Uh, clearly, the connection is keep alive. Uh, we use TLS 1.3, of course, with forward secrecy and mutual X509 certificate verification. So unlike what normally happens when you connect to an HTTPS website with your browser and you don't have your own certificate on your on the browser end, in this case, both endpoints validate each other's X509 certificate. This renders man-in-the-middle attacks way more difficult. Somebody say, say impossible, I uh, don't like the, the word impossible. I mean, I've been working in security for my entire life, so I tend to stay as much away as, as I possibly can from the word impossible. But it's very, very, very hard to perform a man-in-the-middle or a break-and-inspect type of attack on this kind of channel. Now, once that channel is established, now the agent is the client of this client-server communication. Therefore, the agent is the master. The agent is the one that has 100% of the authority over this communication channel. And it uses the intrinsic real-time nature of WebSocket to constantly, in real time, keep that list of pending requests under constant monitoring, which means that every time a new request pops up, here in this list, it is immediately in real time available to the agent if the agent wishes to read that request and pull that request in here on the agent. This internal communication layer is further encrypted with elliptic curve DT Hellman and further mutually digitally digital signature verified uh, using ECDSA. Again, uh, for me, all these encryption and uh, uh, digital signature algorithms are mm, uh, interchangeable. I mean, the moment a better encryption algorithm is available, we will use it. Uh, this is not about encryption. This is about the logic this tool is built. Once uh, this communication is in place, Obviously, if I allow the request collector and agent to exchange any indiscriminate IP packet, I would have done nothing better than a double encrypted VPN. But the key is that since I have designed and developed both pieces of software, I can also enforce the fact that they can only speak our own smart hybrid protocols. So they can only and exclusively exchange digitally signed, well-structured data packets. Whatever doesn't have that particular structure is simply going to be left on the request collector for it to expire and never even be read and pulled in by the agent. But once the agent pulls in a data packet, which is a smart hybrid protocol or SHIP for short, compliant, then the agent unpacks, validates that object, 
extracts only the meaningful information from that object. And I say that because I want to prevent the next question, which is what if I am a godlike hacker and I can manage to hack into the request collector and inject additional payload into these uh, structured objects, that additional payload would just simply be completely ignored. The agent reads the JSON object, extracts the expected payload, builds a fresh, brand new LDAP query, which is run against your LDAP server, which in turn will provide a healthy response, which will be on the agent retranslated to a ship compliant type of response, digitally signed here with a digital certificate, which private key is only available to the agent on the agent, on the one machine that can never be reached by anyone outside of this particular subnet. And once it's finally fully digitally signed, sent back out to the request collector, which will finally make it available to the original requester. Now, Federico, what, what I love about this is that you took into account if Thor was a hacker, because even yeah, if it's a yes. godlike <laughs> hacker, they're not getting in. So even if Thor was a hacker, no go. Yeah, I've, I've been doing this for my entire life, as probably more, more, most of you guys, we all have been doing this for our entire life. So what I had in mind was how do I make it really, 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 really hard for people like right. me, for people like us? <clears throat> and uh, what, what, uh, what uh, have we obtained by doing that? Well, now we have a very secure communication channel that is established outbound. We have a suite of purpose-built smart hybrid protocols that are commandless by design, can only transport, transport purely passive, well-structured data to prevent code injection and IP-based attacks. It's really hard to break because of the double layer of encryption, the double layer of mutual digital signature, WebSocket, forward secrecy, and... Uh, uh, um, it typically, I mean, I, I want to say it, this cannot create an additional attack vector because of all these reasons. On top of that, the solution is actually designed to have linear scalability, both on the request collector side and on the agent side, because they are among them, these clusters of agents and clusters of request collectors are completely stateless. They, they interpret uh, impurity, the stateless nature of REST. Uh, therefore, they typically scale up linearly. We couldn't make them scale up sublinearly, of course, but at least the scaling up is not geometrical, as some of our competitors uh, actually do. All of this without establishing any inbound rule on the firewall, any VPN through the firewall to reach anything inside, and without replicating or copying your identity database ever anywhere outside. So now that we have the transport, <laughs> I hope this is not too boring. No, uh, no, now that we awesome. have the transport, how can we make traditional, no, we can make traditional username and password or OTP authentication more secure, yes. But we can also invent, and we have something that goes beyond that, that and goes even beyond passwordless, we invented Exceed ID, which is a known reusable time-based one-time code that substitutes both usernames and passwords, and I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and then we realized that with Exceed ID, there still is something that the user has to type in manually. So how can we prevent even that? M maintain and retain the security of everything we've done, but make the user experience very, very easy. So we came up with Exceed IQ, which is still Exceed ID, passwordless and usernameless under the hood, but it uses pseudo random digitally signed QR codes on the application you're trying to log into to identify the device or the app you're logging into at any moment in time. And those are rolling codes as well. And while we were, we were at it, we also invented a method to establish remote desktop sessions, RDP, typical Microsoft protocol, using one-time 
credentials to the virtual machine you are remote desktoping. Sorry, I just created a new English word <laughs> into. Because, uh, you know, I don't know if you have deployed, uh, well, you, all of you have deployed VMs in the cloud. And the one thing that never changes is the credentials you RDP into those virtual machines uh, that you use to RDP into those virtual machines. Well, unless you have Exceed. If you have Exceed, every time you remote desktop into any of your cloud VMs or wherever those VMs are, they don't necessarily have to be in the cloud, you can use Exceed RDP, which is Exceed ID in the background under the hood, to actually use one-time credentials on every subsequent uh, remote desktop connection. So yes, let people sniff and acquire the credentials that you have you have just used to RDP into your VM. They will not be able to reuse them anymore to perform uh, a successful attack against your VM. So Federico, do you randomly generate those credentials in the backend for Active Directory or are you replacing the authentication mechanism for RDP in that case? No, ultimately, we still use the LDAP or the Active Directory behind, mm -hmm. but uh, there is a further layer of isolation before the Active Directory, and there is a huge amount of math. Uh, and I remember I didn't even like math when I was in high school, but no, I do now. Yeah. Uh, there is a huge amount of math to make the uh, identity and access service be able to actually compute from the exceed ID, the one-time code, which one is your claimed identity, so basically your Active Directory username, which is never transferred anywhere, mm -hmm. as well as to validate that you really are who you claim to be. Run that by the Active Directory based on additional data that we store in the uh, in the Active Directory because uh, the beauty of LDAP is that you can store whatever additional field right, you right. want in that database mm -hmm. and uh, get the authentication back uh, and actually let you in. Now, we know who you are, but the, the nice thing about this uh, is that the entire code changes every, say, 60 or 120 seconds, not just the validation part. Because I've seen solutions like this, and then you generate five codes, and you realize that the first uh, four uh, letters, four uh, <laughs> characters, mm -hmm. are always the same. OK, that's the username. And then the rest is the OTP. No. In our case, the entire ID changes every single time. And uh, uh, there are two types of, uh, of uh, expiration. Uh, you use it. If you use it, it dies immediately. It mm -hmm. cannot be reused the second time. And if you don't use it within its time window, typically 60 seconds, but you can configure it, it will also die because it's also time-based like a TOTP. So after a certain number of seconds, it will not be valid anymore, even if it's not being used. By doing that and by changing every bit of the Exceed ID, every XX seconds, we have achieved the, the effective reset of 100% of the possibility space for a brute force attack. Because after 60 seconds, something that you have already tried and ditched because it didn't work might have now become the, the correct option to authenticate that particular user. So it's really, really hard to perform a brute force attack when 100% of your possibility space changes every very few seconds. Or a, a, replay, a replay attack, for that matter, is correct. next to impossible. Yes. Yeah, correct. Exactly. And there is also no need for the Exceed ID generator to be online. I mean, if it's your app on your phone, it's perfectly fine for it to be in airplane mode. Uh, again, there's a huge amount of math behind it. But uh, it's, uh, it, it doesn't require an online device. So the result of this is no username, no password. It's one time, no reusable credentials, and uh, no brute force, uh, and no replay attack. So uh, imagine something like this uh, applied uh, to something like verified by Visa. Uh, you know that they they uh, request uh, 
um, your uh, verification, identity verification. Uh, but how does that happen? Uh, you know, the, the merchant actually sends some sort of personal ID <laughs> over to Visa. In this case, not your username, but your credit card number. That is the ID. And Visa verifies by asking you to type in the same password every single time. I mean, I have a visa, and uh, uh, if I try to buy something online that's more than a certain amount of money, this is what I get. Now, imagine this substituted with Exceed ID. I will have to type in every time a one-time code, and now the merchant doesn't have the need to send any of my identification data over to Visa, because that one Exceed ID would allow Visa to verify, to, to infer, to compute who I am claiming to be and validate it in a single step and then send only the authorization code back to the merchant for that one transaction. So the, the merchant would not have to share with Visa my claimed identity. But we want to go outside of just uh, web applications and the world is so much bigger. In this world, in the real world, there's not only web applications and mobile applications. There are gas pumps. There are ATMs. I want to be able to log into all of those with an incredibly easy user uh, experience, but with the power of Exceed ID that I just explained to you, credentialless authentication. And sure, sure, as my name is Federico, I don't want to swipe my card anywhere, not on a gas pump, not on a bank ATM. Do you guys, uh, are, uh, are you guys aware of the statistics of those skimmers that people, that, that, that you know, the thieves put in front of uh, gas pumps and, uh, and uh, ATMs, and they basically clone, they copy your card and, uh, and then they go and reuse it later. So I don't want to swipe my card, but I want a uh, user experience that's just as easy. Okay, so let's have that bank ATM or that gas pump for that matters display a QR code that contains uh, totally random information that refreshes every 60 seconds. And that randomness is also digitally signed by us for additional security, but it's real randomness. It only allows the IAS, the, the authentication server, to know in front of what I am in this particular moment in time nothing else. It doesn't contain any authentication credentials. You pull up your app on your phone, you scan that QR code, boom, magically you are in your web app or your gas pump in front of you unlocks and you can put gas in your car or your uh, ATM logs you into your bank account and you can withdraw $300. Okay, how do we keep it safe? Well, if you really notice how we did it here, the weak point clearly is the client application, whether it's a web browser or a, the application that runs the ATM machine or the mini app that runs in the gas pump. Well, no credential ever, no authentication ever runs through that point, through that device or through that piece of software. The phone scans the QR code, it generates an Exceed ID here locally. In this case, you have to have your phone online. It cannot be in airplane mode because the phone will not interact with the device that, ha that has displayed the QR code. The phone will actually send the, Exceed ID, the generated Exceed ID to the server application that will have the Exceed ID framework behind it to validate the identity. You can imagine here being the active directory, the agent, uh, everything that I have in my previous slide. And only once this is all accomplished and positively authenticated, send a session token over to the authentication, which is valid for as long as you want it to be valid. All the communication that contains the one time uh, code is direct between your mobile device that has generated the Exceed ID and the backend infrastructure that runs the, the application and the uh, identity and access server. The weak point where there could be skimmers, where there could be spyware, where there could be uh, any type of weakness, well, that point is never even in the communication of any credential. 
Federico, uh, if someone were to steal my phone and or gain access to my phone and have access to the secure storage of my phone, could they impersonate my identity? Uh, your store never stores that information. It's generated uh, in real time when you need it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, yes, there is another point that has to be analyzed. If I have your phone in my hand and I can effectively use, I can launch the Exceed ID application, uh, well, then, yes, I, I could uh, generate your Exceed ID locally. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why the Exceed ID app on the phone is also protected uh, uh, by asking you one or two uh, re-personal um, re validation uh, methods, whether, uh, you know, the, that can be the same that you use to unlock your phone or sure. can be different from the ones that you unlock your phone with. And I'm so assuming I can... Else, sorry? I'm assuming I can invalidate that. Like if I lose my phone, there's a point in time where I can say... Hey, I've lost my phone, so don't let anyone else authenticate with that with that phone. Absolutely, or that the Exceed right? ID app establishes a WebSocket connection over which uh, it can monitor its own status, and uh, uh, we have kill signals. Yeah. So, okay, you've lost your phone, kill signal. The mobile app at, at soon, like in certainly milliseconds, will pick up that kill signal and uh, destroy all of its local storage by actually overriding it with a DOD 5220.22M secure data erasure algorithm and then delete it and then delete itself. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we do have a kill switch for the app. Yep, awesome. But this is just the beginning. This is the real world that we envision, not just identity management, uh, but on that sealed channel, if you really think about it, we are just uh, one smart hybrid protocol away from tackling several other scenarios. I imagine a world where anyone from anywhere can request services to devices and objects that run in protected networks uh, with no open ports whatsoever on firewalls. And uh, these uh, objects provide those services. It can be identity management. It can be a uh, key or certificate vault and, and attached services, like, for example, digitally sign S-MIME this email before I send it out, but without that digital certificate ever leaving the key vault that is inside your protected network, uh, or uh, retrieve an on-premise uh, or an, uh, a protected network uh, unstructured storage object, a file like an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document, or why not uh, query using uh, old data or open data, depending on which jargon you prefer, uh, from anywhere in the world, but according to the rules that you set forth here on the agents, on the machines that can never be even reached by a single IP packet sent by a malicious actor. This is the world we envision. For now, we are obviously focused uh, on identity management because that's the low hanging fruit and that is probably the number one most uh, sensitive topic today. So we thought it was appropriate to uh, start from that. Uh, let me see if I can um, bore you just another, for just another moment. Uh, I would like to share one more thing with you. Okay, let me share actually my Federico, uh, how, how long did it take you to come up with the, the design and implementation of this? The design, uh, four or five months. The actual math behind it, figure out the math, uh, another almost a year, uh, 10, 11 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the coding part uh, was uh, being performed uh, uh, concurrently as we were figuring out we were also coding so three four months later we started delivering the first 
solutions. Um, in fact, uh, if you see the, the phone app today uh, is, is, a, is a mess. I mean, it can't even be shown to users yet uh, because it's, it's absolutely ugly and it contains 96% of the information is the bad information for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does work. Uh, there's one thing that I uh, uh, wanted to talk about, wanted to show you is actually this. You see, this is a VMware workstation running on my computer here at home. And this actually is uh, an Active Directory. So, well, I am a Comcast customer. Uh, I don't have uh, a public static IP address here at home. And I am running my Active Directory in a virtual machine in VMware Workstation. Uh, Comcast can change my IP address at any time. Uh, I don't have any inbound ports. If you want, guys, I can give you my public IP address in this moment. Uh, and you can check, the, you can port scan it. There, there's nothing. There's just no way to reach this, this VM right here, which is my Active Directory. Yet, I can pull up the portal, log into my portal, and let's go see here. See, this is all real, working in real time. And you actually can do that magic I was talking about before. This is one of my VNs in AWS. Magic. I mean, and I am not in as administrator with a constant, never changing password. I am in with a one time profile. I disconnect. I will never connect again with that username and password. Next time I connect, it will be a different username and different password. So I think I bored you enough, guys. <laughs> so no, if I, can, any I can listen question, to the app. I'm more than happy to to answer them, to do my best at least, to try to answer them. I mean, you just think about when you're a security professional and you have to write a piece of code, right, to accomplish some goal. How long on average do you spend designing that, right? You yeah. probably do it in your head while you're coding it and a couple of days later, you've got a script, you might spend another couple of days to clean it up, maybe post it to GitHub, share it with your team, right? You spent Federico almost a year in design mode to accomplish yeah. this goal. That's right. that's very telling. And the ability to integrate it into all of your existing authentication sources. What what struck me about what they were building was I didn't have to figure out how to replicate my username, password into some other repository to federate. I didn't have to move data. What they did is they built this really interesting layer on top that allowed you to use the secure communication channel to leave credentials where they were, federate them, but also in a way that no one's thought about of just eliminating username password altogether. I mean, very innovative to me from an, from an identity space when we think about the concept of a universal ID, mm -hmm. right? This promise that no matter what I use, right, I can authenticate to multiple <coughs> mechanisms and use that to, without creating variations of usernames and passwords, right? Yeah, I, I think there's two, two very distinct problems, right, when I think about federated or universal identity. One, first step is you got to get rid of the username and password, right? Two, you got to make it, uh, interoperate with any system, mm -hmm. right? And Federico, it sounds like you've accomplished that. Is basically what I what I took uh, one of the I think top things I took from this segment. Yes, because this layer of abstraction is uniform among all of the identity database that you put this um, exceed technology in front of, and this layer of abstraction, which is uniform can become that universal ID without usernames and without passwords. So you, the user, don't even need to know which Active Directory has actually authenticated you right now 
but you know for sure that nobody else but you could have authenticated against whatever service you are authenticating in this moment. It, what I love is it gets us all thinking about, at, at a higher level, like thinking differently about authentication. Yes. Right? Which proving who you are, right, is a huge part of that, right? Right. And, and not being able to allow someone to spoof who you are, right? All those things that we have to think about at a much and higher level. And not worrying level. about, look, if my username password gets hacked potentially, and it's not on the dark web, mm -hmm. somebody can't use it for attacks, right? right? It, it changes the concept of the monetization around identity and the uh, ability to not worry if it's on the dark web because right. it won't work because with this code concept, if the code gets taken, it's only valid for a certain amount of time. It mm -hmm. expires. You can't do replay attacks. You, so I, I, and if you I, used it, it's already expired. Yeah. As right. soon as you use it, it's gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so this was a very just when, when they pitched me the story originally, I'm like, oh, I see the value. Yeah. I see the value of federation in a way that's more secure than the way mm -hmm. we're doing it today. And I saw the opportunity to move to a universal ID concept where a single authenticator rotating token can be used to authenticate into multiple services that simplifies all the challenges we have today when it comes to identity. I'm excited that we're at this point having these conversations. Is that what that like, smell is? Yeah, I, like, I, I'm <laughs> like, like I feel like there's like a panel of people that we know that are really uh, on the, like the, the bleeding edge of solving this identity and access and authentication problem. Yeah, so. because as you guys know, app user data is, is where I see the future of where we're going. Uh, we've seen some really innovation in the application side. We're seeing some stuff on the data side with around homomorphic encryption. But what I haven't seen until now is really this revolutionary thought on how we attack the identity problem. And mm -hmm. that's something that I think Federico and the team have really tried to solve in a way that nobody else has thought of. Awesome stuff, Federico. This is, thank you. This is that? really different from anything we've seen for a while. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that was going through my mind is, what do you have in terms of contextual awareness capability? Like, uh, you know, can, can we differentiate between Paul logging in from his, his, his machine and his grandma's machine? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Part of the meta information that uh, goes into that exceed ID actually allows us to differentiate from where, from what particular device uh, or what particular mm, browser, in case you're using a browser, uh, you're logging in. So two browsers in two different virtual machines or when you use, uh, you log in from your phone and from your browser at home uh, or from two browsers in two different locations, uh, uh, some meta information will be contained in the Exceed ID uh, to tell the IAS, uh, the Identity and Access Server, uh, where exactly that um, particular authentication attempt came from. So you can attach a meaningful session metadata object to it. That'd be great. By the way, you can also store cool. that metadata in the, in the LDAP server oh, itself, yes. if you so wish. We don't force you to, but we give you rules to do so, if you so wish. Yeah, and what, what I love, you, you know, coming from the university space uh, and trying to tackle this problem, uh, when did I leave there? Over 10 years ago, right? was really hard. Mm -hmm. But the goals were still the same, right? Researchers at various universities want to they just want to do their job right it doesn't matter whether that their university or the university they're collaborating with right students want to be able to authenticate and and, and do their studies without having to worry about all these hoops they have to jump through to authenticate to, to x y and z it's from my background in the university space very much a problem that bubbled to the surface many many different technologies to try and solve this problem. And I'm excited that today we have a lot more innovative research and in products uh, like Exceed that can, that can help this problem. So Federico, thank you so much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. It was really awesome having you. Thank you for having me. Federico, we have uh, five questions for you. Okay. 
Are you, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? There are no right or wrong answers, just merely answers. And, and one is actually a multiple choice with only two options. Okay, sure. And I know I'll how you, as an Italian, I know how you'll answer that one. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be disappointed. There you go. All right. So <laughs> let's go. Three words to describe yourself. Wow. Uh, bold. Uh, undefined age. And uh, shy. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I guess I don't have the mentality of the serial killer. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I never even thought about it. Jeez. That, that, uh, that, that fits with I your... guess I, I would be a, a big failure as a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, fits. that would be your weapon. Failure. Yes, that, that, a, a wine that bottle. Fits. A wine that's bottle. My, that's my weapon. <laughs> a, a wine bottle is a, a perfect I choice. I've been before the first homicide. I was like, I was thinking about killing someone. I have no clue how to do it. Yes. So you, 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 you just go ahead and arrest me. <laughs> that's awesome. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, okay. That would be a very, very long journey through the path of security. I started coding computer software specifically in security when I was seven years old. And uh, I will reveal my age now. I am 46, which means that I've been coding security software for 39 years. So, yeah. It's awesome. 39 years of, of coding. Maybe that should be the title. And there you go. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? You're Italian. Yeah, but I'm not sure I understand the question. I apologize. <laughs> it's, uh, well, we like to say it's popular in Europe, but I guess that doesn't apply, apply here. There's not. different rules for U.S. and in, in Europe. So Correct. But you're Italian. You should go first. Okay. There you go. Federico's going first. So, Federico, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Alive, dead, fictional. Okay. Okay. This is good. Um, father, Stephen Hawking. Uh -huh. Mother, Marie Curie. There you go. Very nice. Very nice. Federico, I have one question for you that I'm going to ask off air, so don't don't leave after this segment. But thank you very much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. And with that, we will take a short break, come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned.